Good evening, everyone. I'm excited to welcome you to tonight's backgrounding and stalker profitability conference. Tonight is session two, Budgeting for Profit, where our speakers will cover budgeting scenarios for stalker and backgrounders, estimating target purchase prices and key marketing concepts. Tonight's webinar is funded through the Kentucky Agriculture Development Fund through the Kentucky Beef Network. My name is Becky Thompson and I am the director of the Kentucky Beef Network and will be acting as your moderator this evening. We are recording tonight's presentations and we will be sharing the links to the videos as well as a copy of the slides next week at the conclusion of our sessions. During this e webinar this evening, we will be posting um, a copy or a link to our evaluations as well as a PDF of the copy of the presentations that our speakers will be using. At any point throughout the webinar, you can ask a question through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will be compiling the questions and answering them at the end of the presentations. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker, Dr. Greg Hellich. Greg? Okay, um, so there are a few things I'm gonna do today. The first is, uh, and Kenny did this yesterday, but we're gonna cover a slightly different method to estimating a sale price based on the futures. Um, and then we're essentially gonna go into trying to, to figure out what kind of prices given a, a target profit you're trying to get, can you bid on cattle, whether you're uh, doing it by backgrounding and feeding largely or doing stockering and, and putting on grass like this picture. Um, and we'll cover a number of different budget scenarios related to backgrounding and, and stockering uh, rel relative to this, this spring and where prices are going into the spring and fall. Um, so again, the first thing I'm gonna do is, is kind of just give you a second method um, for estimating sale prices, similar to what Kenny did yesterday. It's just a little bit different. Um, and some people may like one, some people may like the other. So just another one you can, you can try. Um, basically a five step process. First one, just exactly like what Kenny started out, you're gonna use that CME feeder cattle futures or indexes as we sometimes call it. Um, we're gonna adjust that futures price to a Kentucky, based on a Kentucky basis for what that 800 pound steer would be worth here in Kentucky. Um, we're gonna adjust for lot size. Um, we're gonna adjust for the price slide. In, in other words, if instead of 800 pound steer, you have 850 or 750 or, or whatever. And then finally, we're, I'm not really gonna show you how to uh, adjust for quality differences. Kenny talked about that. Basically, that's, you're just gonna have to do that um, based on kind of the history of your cattle and how they sell. Um, so this slide right here, what I'm gonna do, and, and basically I'm, I'm showing you what Kenny did yesterday, kind of in diagrammatic format in a table format. So what he showed you in terms of that basis, how it moves through the year for Kentucky um, is right here in the second column. So we've got all the months on the left, uh, just like what he showed in, in diagrammatic form, I'm showing in table form what that basis would be kind of for average uh, lot size. And, and Kenny and I estimate it's probably around 20 head here in Kentucky. Now, the other thing I'm, I'm doing on this slide is I'm going to show you, um, in, instead of if you are selling in pot loads, um, what basis you probably want to use rather than that 20 head. So obviously, if, if we're selling by the pot load, we're getting a better basis. Uh, you can see that with this diagram here. So if you're, if you're looking at a, a lot of roughly 20 head and you draw a line up and then draw it to the left there, read that number roughly you know, $17 or so. And then you do the same thing for roughly a pot load and, and read that. If you take the difference between those two, it's roughly $5. In other words, on average, you're doing about $5 per hundred weight and better if you're selling at a pot load size versus to 20. So all I'm doing here is strengthening the basis by $5 across the board from January all the way down to December, which is $5 better than we were selling 20 head at a time. Uh, so essentially you can choose from either of those and if it's something in between kind of extrapolate between those two. Um, so this slide right here, th this was close of, of yesterday. So I had to put this together this morning. So it was close on Tuesday, um, March 22nd. On the left-hand side, those are all the futures contracts month, at least once, you know, there are ones beyond that, but those are the ones that, that we're gonna be concerned about. Uh, the next column is a settle price. And I've, I'm not showing you the actual CME um, 
site, I just, I simply took those numbers from that, that site and I rounded to the nearest dollar just to make this quick and easy. Um, the next column is an estimated basis uh, for a group of 20 head. We'll start with that. We'll go to the pot load here in just a little bit. And so again, for those applicable months, the, those would be those, those estimated basis that we just looked at. Uh, so if we adjust that futures price by that, that negative basis that we have in, in all situations here in Kentucky, we will get the estimated price for that 800 pound steer here in Kentucky if again, we're selling in roughly a, a group of 20 head in any one of those months. Um, so the next thing we're gonna do is, is do the same thing, but do it for pot load group. So uh, again, basically it's just gonna be $5 better. It's gonna strengthen by that. Um, and so essentially that estimated price for 800 pound steer is just gonna be $5 better than we looked at here in the previous slide. Um, so we talked a little bit about this yesterday. Let's just go through again. So if we're looking at, instead of say an 800 pound steer, 900 pound steer or 700 pound steer, how do we adjust for those prices? And, and we need to use that price slide that we talked about. Uh, in the current environment, my guess is that's gonna be somewhere between three and $5 per hundred weight, but it's, it's gonna change kind of every season, every year, just based on the dynamics. With, with really high feed price, we would tend to see that price slide probably in that range. Uh, if when feed prices get really low, we've, we've seen that as high as seven, eight dollars per hundred weight, even on the heavier weight animals. When it's when they're lighter weight animals, say below 650 pounds, it's going to be highly variable. I'm not going to give you any general numbers there that it's going to change um, dramatically, particularly as you go from spring to fall type situation. We're not going to be concerned about that. That's going to kind of be automatically built into the, the method that I'm going to show you here. It's, it's really for those heavier weights that we're going to want to be concerned about that price slide, in, at least in terms of estimating price. All right, so the numbers that you saw there are just what we looked at here a minute ago for those pot load groups. In other words, the estimated price for that 800 pound steer. What I'm doing now is what, what if instead of 800 pound steer, what if we had a 900 pound steer? And let's assume in this case, it's a $4 price slide. So given that we're going from eight to 900 pounds, that's 100 pounds or 100 weight. So that, that would be the full $4 in that price slide. So all those prices would go down by $4 since we're going up in weight um, from that. So again, just subtracting $4 across the board for going from an 800 to 900 pound steer. Now, conversely, what if we had a 700 pound steer instead of 800 pound steer? In that case, the price slide would be in our favor because we have a, a smaller animal. And again, it's hundred pounds. So we do that, that full $4 slide and we'd simply raise the price uh, across the board by $4. So hopefully that's pretty straightforward and simple. Um, so now what we're gonna do is we're, we're gonna start with backgrounding and then we're gonna go into stocker type situations. Uh, but for the, the backgrounding situation, just have a simple kind of scenario here. And this is what I used yesterday. I'm assuming 50-50 corn, gluten, soy hall mix, roughly half the diet, uh, $280 per ton. And then the other half the diet, you know, good quality hay, $75 a ton. We're gonna start with a 550 pound steer put on 300 pounds, take it to 850 pounds, and then sell, uh, should be October 1st, average daily gain of 2.3 pounds per day. So 130 days can start, assuming today, March 23rd, take it to August 1st, that would be that 130 days. So note, we're selling in August, so we're gonna use that August uh, month for futures and basis. So here are those, all those months, and again, if, if we're planning on selling beginning of August, um, that's going to be the contract that we're looking at. Oh, let me back up. So forgot to kind of plug this in. So in this situation, we have, we're estimating we're going to have an 850 pound steer. So uh, we looked at 900 pounds, 700 pounds, but let's, again, this is kind of a refresher course here. So if we're going from 800 to 850 pounds, that's a half a hundred weight, 50 pounds divided by hundred. Uh, so in other words, we would use half that slide since we're going up in weight, we'd subtract half half that slide. So we're going to subtract $2 from each of those uh, months. So that's all I did there. Very simple. So now again, we're planning to sell early August. So we're going to use that August contract and, and use that August basis minus six um, for a pot load. Uh, and, and that gives us an estimated price for the 800 pound steer, $1.73 or $173 per hundred weight. 
an estimated price for the 850 pound steer dollar 71. I like thinking dollar cents. So I, I typically say that. All right, so that's what we're we can throw out all the other months, kind of concentrate on that. That's what we're what we're shooting for. So now this is where I'm going to diverge a little bit from Kenny. So Kenny's method kind of builds in, say, change in trucking costs. So again, the lat, those basis estimates were based on the previous three years. We're in a climate now where, where diesel prices have, have skyrocketed here, um, potentially some other costs related to, to trucking. So given that the difference in base in Kentucky and the Great Plains for the same you know, pot load type situation should be mainly difference in trucking, this is going to obviously drive that difference. So I'm just guesstimating here. You may want to refine this, but I'm assuming, let's say the price has increased on average about $1.25 per loaded mile, say going from uh, $3.75 to $5 or $3.50 to $4.75 a loaded mile. If that's the case, and, and I also just kind of did some guesstimates in, in terms of where are the say main, main finishing areas in Kansas, Nebraska, relative to where we are, let's say around Lexington, it's roughly 800 miles. So if we multiply that by that increase, $1.25 per loaded mile, that gives us about a, a roughly a, a total increase of $1,000 um, for trucking. So if we divide that $1,000 increase by essentially a pot load, which would be 50, 500, 100 weight or 50,000 pounds, that would give us an increase on average of $2 per 100 weight. So in other words, I'm going to it's going to cost us roughly two dollars more per hundred weight to get them there, and our basis will will get weaker by that two dollars per hundred weight. So that's all I'm going to do is adjust it downward by two dollars a hundred weight. So that's where we were, um, say a year or two ago, based on our estimates. So if we guesstimate that increase in, in trucking, which will weaken basis, that will go to minus eight instead of minus six, and that will adjust those other prices downward by. Uh, two dollars a hundred weight. So in the end, what we're what our best estimate would be for a pot load here in Kentucky for eight hundred fifty pound steer averaging on that pot load would be about a dollar sixty nine, and that's what we're going to um, start with in the analysis. In other words, that's that's what we're going to assume we're going to sell um, our steers for in August. Um, Here is kind of just a very simple budget in terms of the main costs, and, and I will. Kind of preface this by saying these are are mainly the variable costs. You're going to have some fixed costs like um, depreciation facilities, interest on facilities, uh, your labor. I also don't have labor in here. So in, in other words, when we look at a return at the very end, what I'm calling gross profit, that will also have to compensate you for those things, at least in the long run. And we'll talk a little bit about that, how you can look at that at the very end. Um, so we're selling, we're planning on selling 850 pound feeder steer for $1.69. Um, I'm going to give you three different buy prices and I'll, I'll explain. I obviously I, I played around with those to come up with, with certain gross profits as you'll see down at the bottom. So $1.85, $1.90 and $1.95. And I realized you know, for 550 pound steer, that's higher than what we've seen pretty much anywhere in the last few weeks. And we'll see probably why here in a minute that's the case. Um, so that, that would be the calf cost, um, 550 pounds multiplied by that price. Uh, total feed cost, that's going to be the same in all, and most of these are going to be the same in all situations. Uh, the hay cost, vet medicine, uh, mineral commission, and I'm assuming there that you're, you're above the, the minimum level to get kind of that, that bulk or lower discount commission. That would include checkoff insurance, all those other things. Uh, trucking that would be bringing them in, taking them out on at, you know, all your costs divided by number of calves. Interest, technically that would vary a little bit by your buy price. I didn't go through that detail, but in other words, maybe $1.85, that's 18 and $1.95, that's 22, but not enough to probably worry about. Death loss, um, other costs. And then if we add all those together, uh, we get those total costs of the bomb. We've got the total revenue, same across all situations. Again, assuming that steer is going to sell for $1.69. Then if we subtract the two, we get, again, what I'm calling gross profit. That's essentially our return above those variable costs that we've looked at there, but they haven't included our fixed, fixed costs plus labor that we essentially have to, at least in the long run, cover. So at $1.85, we would be making a gross profit of about 80 bucks per, per steer, $1.90, gross profit roughly about $50. And, and a, if we bought those steers for $1.95, we 
rough gross profit of $25. And that's roughly what I was trying to do is, is get as close to 25, 50 and, and 75 as I could for a reason. Um, so from my experience, and, and I don't work with a lot of backgrounders, but from the ones I have, typically what they tell me is kind of if they can get a return above those variable costs of $50 or greater, they're, they're generally going to, you know, get calves in that situation. Some will, will say if, you know, if my only choice is to, you know, make $25 an animal and, and I, and that's all I can do, I may do that that, that year. Obviously, they're not going to cover their fixed costs that year, but they're at least covering their variable and a little bit fixed. Um, and probably in a really good year, they're making that $80 to $90 per head. So trying to show a realistic range of, of where they may be, again, I realize those, those buy price are a little bit higher than where they're they have been, but I, I think we're going to get there real quick. And, and when we get to the stock ring scenarios, I think you'll understand why I'm, I'm saying that. Um, so very quickly, and this is going to be a lead in for Kenny when he does marketing, but what if the price drop, end up dropping by $10 a hundredweight? In other words, what if the futures, you know, across the board went down $10 a hundredweight and our, our expected sell price end up dropping by roughly $10, uh, which is, is a, a completely legitimate scenario, uh, could increase by $10, but I think given the volatility we've had in the recent years, we all know that would be, that's a very probable situation where, where it could either increase or drop by $10 on weight. What would that do for those uh, budgets? So simply instead of getting $1.69, we're gonna get $1.59 when we sell in, in early August. And you can see what that does to those gross, gross profits. Basically, if it drops by 10 cents a pound for 850 pound animal, that's $85 uh, per head drop in that gross profit. So we're, we're in negative territory, unfortunately, in every scenario, even that, that highest profit scenario. So hopefully that, that's an obvious lead in for Kenny when he does marketing in terms of, you know, if you want to protect those margins, what are some options for doing that? All right. So let's say that we deter, we're not in that scenario where we're, we're back in there. And let's say that, you know, we, we could buy those calves for $1.85 or $1.90 and, and we go ahead and do it. Um, then the next question is once we, we start approaching August, uh, the next question is we've already pulled the trigger. We bought those calves. Essentially at that point, should we potentially take them another 50 pounds instead of, in other words, instead of selling 850, should we maybe take them to 900, maybe 925, et cetera. So this is where we come back to our value gain and our total cost gain that we talked about yesterday. I've changed it based on the conditions we're looking at here. So the four, $4, well, we didn't talk about that, but let's assume $4 price slide star off, we'll change that to three and five. You see how it affects things. And this, let's assume that the sell price initially was $1.69. Um, so again, um, that middle column is that value gain. The column on the right is, is the cost gain for that, that every incremental pound. So we can look, if we look at the 900 pounds, so in other words, if we went from 850 to 900 pounds, we look at that 900 pound weight range. Um, every pound that we put on, we, our gain would be $1.30 and it would cost $1.06 six to put that last pound on. So in other words, our net difference between that, that two would be 24 cents that we're making per pound. So over 50 pounds, that would be $12. So in other words, we would gain $12 in, in essentially gross profit by, by going another 50 pounds, if, if that in fact was the scenario. So most likely that, I think we would do that. Most folks would do that. They've, got, they've taken another 50 pounds or greater. Uh, would they take it to 950? Um, it's a difference of, we're gaining 18 cents per pound there. That's about $9 over 50 pounds. So yeah, probably a lot of people would do that also. Now, what if that price slide, and this is something you would have a better feel for once you got to close to August or you're in August, because you can sell it then, or you again, you could decide to hold a little bit longer. So let's say we get to that point and the price slide is it, based on you looking at the markets at that point is, is $5 per hundred weight rather than four. How is that going to affect it? At, at 900 pounds, essentially that difference now is 16 cents. So essentially you've made $8 on that last 50 pounds. Would you do it? Um, I think you're getting marginal at that point in terms of does it make sense? Because again, you've got to probably cover a few additional costs that we're not including here. Um, on the conversely, what if what if the price slide was closer to $3 per hundred weight? It's going to make it look more favorable. 
so now, for instance, even at 950 pounds, we've got a 28 cent difference between that we're gaining in value over the cost. Um, so that, that would be $14 that we made since down at last 50 pounds. So essentially, we had not just take them to 900 pounds, we'd probably want to take them to 950 unless we had to get rid of the calves and, and say, get a whole new set of calves for some other reason not related to just overall profitability here. Um, let me try to remember what I was going to point out here. Um, oh, oh, okay. So one thing I want to point out here is this doesn't, this would not necessarily include a carry in the market. So this would be based on if the market kind of stays the same. In other words, if, if the futures price stayed the same going from say uh, August to September to October. Um, in the case of, in the current environment though, that's not the case. In other words, in August, at least right now, that futures price is, is a dollar seventy nine, and September it goes up to dollar eighty two. Uh, so in other words, there's a three dollar carry in the on a hundred weight basis on that market, and also based on on Kenny's data, the the uh, basis improves uh, by a dollar. So in other words, we gain four dollars on the futures, we gain one dollar on the basis. So we essentially gain four dollars a hundred weight there. If you multiply four dollars per hundred weight. Um, by that say nine, 900 pounds or 900 weight, um, we've, we've gained $36. So in other words, you would also want to account for that. And that would be even more reason to, to take them another 50 pounds or potentially another 100 pounds. In other words, it's not just on that value gain that we're, we're, we're also gaining on the market since we've got that carry. Um, so now what we're going to do is, is go into stocker cattle and at the very end, we'll kind of compare the outlook for stocker cattle versus backgrounding and, and talk about some implications based or for backgrounding operations, given where the market is for stocker cattle. So similar to uh, background, what we'll come up with kind of a, a situation that we'll go with here. So let's say we're going to place calves in early April, take them for just a little over six months. So from early April to early October, uh, let's assume we're putting on one and a half pounds a day on average. It's, and this, these are assumptions that will come back to cost for pasture. Let's assume it's gonna take us 1.1 acres for a 550 pound steer and just trying to keep it consistent with the background and that's why I'm using that 550 pound steer. Um, that will essentially bring the weight up from 550. So essentially we'll add 275 pounds uh, that will bring that finished weight to 825 pounds in early October. So you've seen this slide before. We did the same one for backgrounding because this essentially predicting prices, but instead of using August, since we're going to be selling in October, we will use that October uh, futures and, and use that estimated basis in Kentucky for that. So that estimated weight for an 800 pound steer, we've still got to convert that to 825, but for 800 pound steer would be $1.75 in pot load groups based on that historical uh, basis data. Uh, but remember that was based on last three years and doesn't include the increase in, in um, trucking costs. So let's account for that. So in other words, we'll start with $1.75, but again, uh, most likely basis is going to weaken by about $2 a hundred weight. That's my best guess. So that's where we were. Um, I'm going to bump that up. So estimate that instead of minus eight, it's going to be minus 10. That brings our estimated steer price down by, by $2 a hundred weight. All right. So that'd be for 800 pound steer. In this case, we are estimating that we're going to have a slightly larger steer, 825 pounds. So, and let's assume that same $4 price line to start with. So how is that gonna change that, that final estimated price? So we're going from 800 pounds to 825. So 25 pounds divided by 100 pounds is one fourth. So one fourth of that $4 slide per 100 weight would be $1. In other words, we're gonna adjust that price down by $1 100 weight since we're going up in weight. So instead of $1.73, $1.72. So that's gonna be our estimated price, $1.72. And then here are, again, I'm just gonna give you a very basic budget. Um, obviously, you'd want to refine this based on, on your estimates. So I'm just kind of giving you a place to start both here and with the backgrounding. So for pasture charge, what I would recommend here is, is kind of your variable costs. Again, and you could throw in fixed costs, but most farmers I've worked with typically just look at their variable costs. So this would be um, fertilizer if you're using it, clipping pastures if you're doing that, um, 
maybe some basic fence upkeep, you know, those, those kind of things. So not a lot, but $33 per animal, which worked out to $30 per acre and that's uh, multiplied by 1.1 acres. Uh, vet costs $20 a head in, in the solid per head basis. Interest $33. It's higher here because we're keeping it longer instead of 130 days, 183 days, wherever that was. Death loss, $25 a head sale. Uh, same thing, I'm assuming you've hit the minimum for it to get hit the lowest commission, and that includes your insurance, checkoff, et cetera, $18 a head. Hauling uh, mineral, minerals a little bit higher, same thing if we're keeping that animal a little bit longer because uh, we're getting slower. And then other costs, uh, which give us total variable costs of $164 per year. Again, obviously, you'd want to refine this um, for, for using your estimates, but place to start. So with those costs, $164 in variable cost, and that uh, that's estimated sale price of $1.72 for the 825 pound steer, what I'm going to do now is is show you what what purchase prices you would you would have to essentially get certain gross profits. So there there's purchase price going to be on the right, gross profits on the left. So in other words, what purchase price would you need? To, to get a gross profit of $50, $75, $100, all the way up to 150 based on, again, the, the variable costs that we looked at and that sale price of $1.72. So I've done the math, I'm not going through that, but I just, for time's sake, kind of go through and, and show you. So if all that we were trying to get was a $50 profit, hopefully, hopefully most stocker operators are trying to do better than that, but on a bad year, they, they would probably buy calves at, at whatever price that was to get $50 gross profit. But if, if that was the case, they could they could bid the price all the way up to $2.19 per pound, which seems really high. I understand that. We'll talk about that in a minute. $75 gross profit, the price drops to $2.14. $100 per head gross profit goes down to $2.10. $125, $2.06. And if we were going to get a gross profit of $150 per steer, which is really good, most years, most stocker operators are not going to do that roughly right around two dollars a pound which again is higher than what we've been seeing uh, but we've not had grass fever yet so if we look at that and again even take the the high profit estimate of 150 dollars gross profit that translates to purchase price of two dollars and one cent just call it two dollars even it's close enough now what i want you to think about is compare that to what backgrounders essentially could afford to pay. So let's look at that slide again with a backgrounding situation. So even if we're just looking at roughly a $25 per head gross profit, $24 technically, but close enough, the most that we can pay is $1.95, which is actually less than that, that $2 per head um, profit for the stocker operators that were making $150 a head. So in other words, Roughly the same price that we're paying, we're we're getting $100, $125 less profit per annual. So in other words, the question I want you to think about is when grass fever hits, who is going to be able to pay more for these calves? And I think it's pretty obvious. Again, a background of the most that they're going to be able to pay in the current environment is about $1.95, probably less, because um, I would say a lot of backgrounders are not going to want to buy those calves at that low gross profit. So the absolute max is probably $1.95. Again, if we look at the stocker operators, they can easily bid well above $2 um, a pound if they need to. And they're certainly going to bid up to $2 um, if, if they need to and to beat out the backgrounding folks. So what I want you to think about now is with these high feed costs, and this is kind of typically what we see when we get really high feed costs in the spring. This isn't necessarily going to be the case in the fall, but in the spring, we've got lots of grass out there. Uh, the stocker operators are just generally easily able to outcompete the backgrounders when that feed price is high. When the, when the feed price drops, that's not all the situation. Backgrounders can compete a lot easier than they can with these high feed costs. Um, which gets me to this, back to this slide here. So if you are a backgrounder and you still have calves that, that say you're in the situation, you brought them to 800 pounds or 850 pounds, and you're thinking of getting rid of them to get another group, I guess what I want you to think about is, are this year, are you realistically gonna be able to get another group in the next month or so uh, at a price that you need to, to make a decent gross profit? And I'll, you know, obviously use your own estimates, refine what I showed you, but I think it's gonna be pretty tough this year for 
Um, anyone do that unless you do it real quick before these prices start going up. And my hunch is they, they probably even this week have um, given how warm it's been and, and how green the grass is starting to get. Um, but look, what I want you to do now is look at the, the value of gain relative to the total cost of gain. So in other words, if you took that steer for the background or from 850 to 900 pounds, that value of gain is not a whole lot greater than the total cost of gain, just six cents um, a pound and over 50 pounds, that essentially is $3. So really not enough by itself to compensate you for doing that. But remember, or what I want you to show you now is there's one other thing that we talked about earlier, and that's we also want to look at how the market's changing. So that's what we're going to do with this slide. So let's just look at March, April, and May. And so look at that sell price. Essentially, we have a, a pretty big carry in the market. Now, March is basically mostly settled. And so that $6 carry in the market really right now is not a $6 carry from late March to April. It's probably more like a 3 or $4 carry would be my guess. But we also improve in terms of basis. So if you look at the estimated price increase from $1.47, $1.53, again, part of that isn't going to be there, that difference, because the way the March settles. But I would say we, we've probably got at least a $4 improvement in the market going from March, late March to April. Uh, so even if we use that $4, and it may be fine, but if we use $4, multiply that by essentially a nine-weight animal, um, and, and we've increased our profits by over $30 just in the market improvement alone per head for, for that one month. So my guess is, or I guess what I would want, what I would be thinking about and probably be very serious about doing if I was backgrounding and I had that essentially 800 pound or 850 pound animal right now, I would probably keep it a little bit longer based on what I'm seeing here with the carry in the market. Again, value of gain versus the cost of gain isn't going to get you much at all by itself, but given the carry in the market, that that essentially is, is another $30 per head for carrying it one more month. Actually, not one more month, 30 or 50 pounds, which is probably about two thirds of a month at, at that 2.3 pounds a day. Um, that would, let's go back. Yeah. So it, even going to 950, um, you know, technically you're losing a little bit. Uh, in terms of the cost gain versus value. But again, we've still got that carrying the market even going into May, um, another $3 multiply that, that $3 again by, by a nine-way annual, we're about $27 uh, increase per head just in the carrying the market itself. So to me, it makes sense to keep those animals to higher weights uh, this year because you're probably, if, if you do sell them now, you're probably not gonna get anything um, in the next few months. Again, unless you buy them right now, um, and, and it may be too late right now is my guess. Um, so that's, that's the end of my presentation. We probably wanna save questions, I'm guessing, until the end. So I'll let Becky decide on that. I will unshare. We do have one question and I think you might wanna go ahead and get it answered okay. now. Um, it's asking how often should you do weigh-ins? So that I do not know because I personally, you know, we don't weigh cattle. We, fin we finish cattle on grass. We, I mean, they get weighed when they come in, they get weighed when they go out. So um, obviously that is not ideal. Most people probably want to weigh their cattle on occasion. Um, I, unfortunately, I'm not the person, that, I'm not a good example is what I'm telling you. Um, so I'm not sure. Okay, just as a reminder to our attendees, if you do have questions, please use the Q&A box. Um, but at this time, we'll move on to our next presenter, uh, Dr. Kenny Burdine. Thanks so much, Becky. Give me just a sec to get pulled up here, and I think we're good to go. So I'm going to just kind of open by showing my basic thank you slide and just to kind of recognize again what Becky said earlier that we appreciate the funding for the program through the Ag Development Fund or from the Ag Development Fund through the Beef Network. Of course, I'm on here with, you know, two of my UK colleagues and we partnered on this program, Greg and Jonathan. Um, Nicole Atherton works with us a lot on this and she, she's not on this evening and certainly Becky with, with the Beef Network and for hosting and everything. So really glad to have this partnership and thank you to work on these together. And I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to you again here for the next 30 minutes or so. So the plan for what I'm going to do is walk through, I almost want to say kind of some nuts and bolts type things. 
And, you know, some pieces of this, you know, some of you may already be using some other pieces, you know, you, you may not actually use, but it's important when you're moving, you know, groups of cattle and you're, you know, selling cattle in different ways to understand some basic concepts. So I'm going to revisit the concept of lot size a little bit and give you a perspective on a little bit different kind of from the buying and selling side, a little different than what Greg did. Greg talked about it in the sense of how do I adjust, you know, how do I adjust futures uh, to a price expectation and incorporate lot size. I want to talk about shrink. Um, and of course, I'm going to distinguish between actual shrink and pencil shrink because oftentimes when cattle are sold, whether it be through an internet sale or, you know, directly off the farm, you know, shrink, shrink and pencil shrink becomes something that's kind of a negotiation type tool. You need to understand at least how that works. We're going to talk about price slides in a little different sense. Um, and this term gets used a couple of different ways, but you know, you've kind of got the price slide in the sense I've got, you know, how does the market discount price per pound as cattle get heavier? So kind of the market price slide, if you will. Then there's this price slide concept that if I'm selling cattle to someone and there's some uncertainty about the weight, you know, how can we adjust the price that we agree upon based on what those cattle actually weigh, if they weigh different than what I, we, we think they did. And oftentimes we don't know with certainty what cattle are gonna weigh. And then, um, you know, towards the end, I'm going to talk about the importance of, you know, knowing what cattle weigh and then understanding the market. And I think that's, you know, that's things that are important as you think about negotiating and selling cattle, no matter how you sell them. So let's go back and just kind of back up and talk about lot size implications. And again, there's probably very few things in Kentucky that have much more impact on what cattle sell for, you know, given, given obviously, a, you know, a, a set market, you know, environment of some type and how many run through at one time. And, you know, you know, Greg mentioned, I mentioned it last night, we're going to talk about a little more depth right now. But, you know, feeder cattle trade occurs on full semi trucks. So, you know, feeder cattle move from Kentucky in the major cattle feeding areas in 50,000 pound units because that's what those semis hold. So that's really what, you know, a lot of our buying functions are in the state, right? You know, we're taking smaller groups of cattle and we're, we're putting those together, we're grouping and making them uniform, and then we're, we're filling those trucks. And you know that, that's, that's a value that's added in the system beyond what most of us do at the farm gate. And there's a lot of data that would point to this, but you know, naturally groups of cattle that are closest to that 50,000 pound quantity you know, are gonna tend to bring the highest price because a lot of that grouping work is already done, right? You know, those cattle that move through there right at roughly a truckload can pretty much just, just be moved out west pretty easily. Um, this is a silly example, but it illustrates the point pretty well. I use this in class with my undergraduate class and a couple of folks, of the, a couple of folks on that I actually had in class in the past. And I was glad to see that when I was kind of scrolling through the participants this evening. But if I've got, you know, think about two groups of cattle that are, you know, they're bas basically identical. You know, lot A here is 65 steers, average weight is 750 pounds. You know, you know, think they're, you know, they're perfectly uniform, a good set of cattle. That's a load of cattle that weighs you know, for all practical purposes, right at 50,000 pounds, you know, so they can run through the auction yard, they can be sold and can pretty much be sent on to feed yard right off, you know, right, right, right from there very easily. Here's a very similar group of cattle that I couldn't distinguish between individual by individual. The only difference is there's 15 head of these instead of 65. So, you know, the, the total weight of this group is a little over 11,000 pounds. And just kind of put yourself in the shoes of the buyer, if you're thinking, if you're sitting in the sale ring, for example, if that buyer, if he or she buys lot B, what have they got to do? Well, they've got to find another, you know, in this case, roughly, you know, roughly 39,000 pounds worth of cattle to go with those. Okay, so as they're bidding on lot B, they're thinking what they can pay for lot B, they've got to build in this notion that I've got to find some cattle to go with them. So that's, you know, that's kind of a silly and simple illustration as to why, you know, we see some differences based on lot size. Now, the chart to your right is actually the exact same thing that Greg showed you a little bit ago. Um, I've got a little bit different um, expression here. I've got kind of some points in there. But what to understand is each of those circles, you know, signifies a, a number of head that ran through the ring at one time. And this is some data out of bluegrass stockyards over about an eight year period that he and I worked with back in 2014 and 15. The lower left hand corner, because of the mathematical formula we use, this is a single. But then after that, these are groups of five. So here's a group of five, group of 10, 15, and so on. So start at the extremes. On the far right there, because these cattle weighed, I think, about 620 pounds on average, you know, that lot size of 80 was roughly a truckload lot. And again, you know, that lower left-hand corner, that's a single. 
so that truckload lot brought about $21 a hundred weight, 21 cents a pound, more than the single holding everything else constant, everything else constant. Weight of the cattle, fed cattle market, grain market, time of year, everything. The other point that I always like to make is that, you know, once I get to about 10 head, I've captured over 70% of that load lot benefit. And that's important to understand. In a state like Kentucky, where a lot of really small groups move, you really see really steep discounts for extremely small lot sizes. And you can get some pretty big price benefit as you move up, you know, just kind of marginally from there. So, you know, even groups of five and 10, you know, will really do a lot better than singles and twos and threes. So the story is really on the lower left. I mentioned this in this backgrounding and stalker program because, you know, it kind of works in two different ways. And one of the ways that a lot of margin operations add value to cattle is they buy a lot of those smaller groups of cattle that they can tend to get cheaper. They tend to be moving larger volumes. They can group more of those cattle together. So they can kind of upgrade those cattle some by getting some of those lower, you know, those lower lot size cattle bought and then sell them in large groups, you know, down the road when, when they've added value. So they can, they can add weight and make money on the weight gain, but also they get some, in, in some additional benefit because they can take smaller groups at purchase and they can sell larger groups at sale so they can capitalize on that. You know, when Greg went through his budget as well, you know, he talked about sales, uh, you know, sale expenses. So you know, commission, check off insurance, what, you know, what we all pay when we sell through traditional means. And if you're moving through the auction system and the majority of Kentuckians tend to do that, the commission savings, once you get to larger lot sizes, can exceed 50%. You know, it can be the difference, a, a large group of cattle moving through the yards versus one that's very, you know, versus a very small number of cattle. You can be talking a difference of, you know, I don't know, 16 to 20 bucks a head on the low end to as much as 50 or so a head on, on, the, on the more expensive end for smaller lot sizes. So another reason that me moving larger quantities is I sell, I sell in larger groups, I pay a lower commission rates, and there's definitely an advantage there in terms of those budgets that Greg walked through. So lot size matters in a couple of different ways. I'm going to talk about price discovery for a bit, and I don't necessarily mean price discovery the way it's used kind of in the current sense in terms of the fed cattle market. You know, we have, we have pretty good price discovery in the feeder cattle markets, I think, with, you know, with, with pretty much certainty here in this area. We have, we have so many cattle that move through auction system, so many cattle that just move on a negotiated basis. But what I really want to talk about is, is that we take this for granted by working through auction systems and even through internet sales that are auction oriented that this happens. There are a lot of folks that sell cattle private treaty, and there's a good, good way to sell cattle. But I think it's easy sometimes to underestimate how difficult it can be to arrive at, you know, what is a realistic and fair value for a group of cattle. And at times, this can actually be a challenge to the point that it's really hard to know. And, you know, even someone like myself that does watch the cattle markets, you know, I'm kind of watching them from, I hate to say a 20,000 foot view, but I'm not, I'm not in the yards every single day watching cattle. You know, I'm watching reports, I'm watching prices, I'm watching that kind of thing. It's still difficult, you know, to oftentimes discern what makes one group of cattle worth more or less than another group. And understand folks that are on the markets constantly, you know, tend to do a very good job of understanding those dynamics. So, you know, we've talked about futures markets as a way to think about, you know, what a group of cattle are worth. I'm gonna show you a couple of things from AMS report here in just a second. Kentucky Livestock and Green Market Report. And of course, if you're negotiating private treaty sales, you know, you can do that by simply negotiating and or asking a specific price for a group of cattle you've got to sell. Or you could even, you know, base that on some other market that you might be kind of close to. So a couple of things I'll show you here quickly. Number one, this is the Kentucky Livestock and Grain Market Report. Um, this is the most recent one. I think maybe they've gone to doing this every other week now. I'm not certain. But this is the last one that was done. And so this is actually from week before last. And this is just the front page. So this is kind of what it looks like. This is a four-page report. Um, they do email this out. Um, you can access it, though, from the, KB, the Kentucky Department of Agriculture website as well. This is the front page. There's some dairy stuff on the front page, and then you can kind of see at the very bottom of the screen there, that's kind of where some of the grain stuff starts. And, and there's some wholesale feed price stuff that's useful towards the bottom of that first page. But I really want to show you, though, I want to show you 
some of the page some of the some of the pages here of this report that are that are more directly related to cattle. So this is page two, and this is going to be just state average prices for cattle in different weight categories. So you know, Greg was talking about five weight steers, for example, 550 pound steers. And I can go in here and I can look, you know, week before last, you know, steers in that 500, 550 pound range were selling for about $1.70 a pound. When I got to the 550 to 600 pound range, it was more like $1.67 or so. so. I can kind of look and see on a state average basis, you know, how are different, you know, how are different types of cattle selling. These are steers and even large frame ones and twos. Here's the same thing for heifers. And I can see it based on those weight categories. So, you know, Greg also talked about price slide, meaning the market discount. This is a really good way to look at, okay, what's the difference in what a 550 pound steer sells for versus a six or a 650? What's the difference in what a 800 pound steer sells for versus an 850 or 900? So a lot of those things you can get a feel for by looking at reports kind of in this form. There's also some charts there obviously on the right. The third page of this report, I also tend to use some. And this is where they report groups of cattle that sell in, in lot sizes of 20 head or more. So the page I showed you a second ago, that covers cattle that sell typically more in smaller groups. It's everything, but, but there's a whole lot smaller lot sizes in there. This is where they pull out groups of cattle, right? Where, you know, larger groups are. So for example, you know, I'm, I'm where I'm at, I'm at Bluegrass Stockyards in Stanford. So this is from March 10th, 74 head of steers, average 703 pounds, $1.53. Anyway, from West Kentucky, you know, here, here's 23 head at Guthrie, average, average uh, 540 pounds, these were bulls, okay, sold for $1.6250. So any group that goes through in a lot size of greater than 20 pounds gets kind of pulled out separately, you can see them individually, and this, this is oftentimes useful. So these are two ways that you can look at, okay, how, do, how can I get a feel for what the value of the cattle that I've got to sell might actually be? We don't do this much in the state, but you know, it does get used some. And another strategy might be if you can, if you know, if you wanted to use something like what you're seeing, you know, this report that's got cattle prices by weight categories, and actually base what you want to sell or what you want to buy cattle for based on some report like this. So maybe you've got, okay, you know, I want a certain type of cattle. I'm willing to pay, or you know, this much above the market, or I want to pay, or I want this much above the market. And, you know, you base that price, but okay, well, here's what those cattle sold for last week. I want a nickel above that. Can we agree to that price? So, you know, there, there's different ways that can be done. I wanted to just kind of show you a few of those tools that are out there. I do have these bookmarked and I can drop, drop these in the chat as soon as I get done talking to, if that'll be useful to you. Last thing I'll mention too, this is from the AMS Livestock Market Report page. And I wanted to show you this because I want you to know that AMS does a really good job giving us results on a daily basis when cattle sell through the majority of our auction markets. And they're kind of sorted here by day. But this is, this is one list I've kind of copied and pasted in two columns. But this is where Kentucky starts. And all the way through here on the left-hand side, and about ooh, a little over halfway down the right-hand side. Those are all Kentucky auction markets and Kentucky sales, right, that are reported um, on, a, on a weekly basis. So we have a lot of access to good market information. I, I've got this link as well, but Mark and I can drop it in the chat in just a little bit. I wanna talk about the concept of shrink a little bit. And it's something most of us understand. And I just wanna kind of give you a perspective on it from a cattle marketing um, viewpoint. So generally when we use the term shrink in cattle marketing, we're talking about weight loss during transport. Cattle are going to weigh less during transport. If you weighed a group of cattle on the farm, loaded them in a trailer, hauled them to some sort of either stockyard, certified scales and weigh point, unload them and weigh them again, they're going to weigh less. And I'm going to use that term as actual shrink. So if mo you know, most of you on the, you know, on the, uh, the webinar probably sell cattle through the yards, you know, you just know for a fact that when the cattle get to the yards, they weigh a bit less than they did at the farm. You know, and that's, that's mostly gut feel, but it's still pounds. Now, if you start thinking about selling cattle um, private treaty, or you see this in internet sales, you'll see the term pencil shrink come up. And the best way I can describe this, if, if the true shrink, the true weight loss is what I call actual shrink, then pencil shrink is an artificial weight reduction that we use to account for the fact that we know those cattle are gonna lose some weight loss in transit. So for example, 
I mean, if I've got cattle that I'm looking to sell on the farm, from, you know, and weigh on the farm and sell, it's very common for those cattle to be weighed on the farm and then for a 2% pencil shrink to be applied, which is something, you know, that on-farm weight gets discounted by 2% and that becomes the, the price or the, that, that becomes the number of pounds that the price or value is based on. Two is very common. Um, I actually used Bluegrass Stockyards internet sale data for my dissertation back, gosh, Greg and I worked together on that. That was 2011, I think, Greg, if memory serves me correct. You would see 3% in some situations, but in most cases, it would be kind of a unique case where the cattle, maybe it said they were muddy or something like that. So typically you saw 2%. Um, you typically don't see a shrink if the cattle are going to be hauled somewhere else to a delivery point and weighed on the ground because the idea is, well, they've already shrunk. So that actual weight is going to include that shrink. But again, this is something that, you know, that has to be dealt with or considered um, if you're selling cattle through internet sale or, you know, through some sort of private treatment method. And, you know, in those cases, you'll see, you'll see shrink, shrink specified as part of the conditions of the sale. Um, so sometimes I think people almost overthink shrink, and, and that's probably a, a poor way to say it for an economist, but understand that this gets built into the price, right? If, if I weigh cattle on the farm and, and, you know, choose not to pencil shrink them, okay, then yes, I've got more pounds there. But in all honesty, if I'm getting bids on those cattle through an internet sale or through private treaty, those bids are going to reflect the fact that they know those cattle are going to have a bit more gut fill than some that might have been delivered somewhere else. So I think sometimes we can overthink shrink a little bit, but know what the concept tends to be. Here's a quick example, and I'll, I'll keep these, you know, as, as simple as I can. Let's just say that I've got, you know, three buyers that are going to come to the farm with a group of cattle, for example, to keep it simple. So buyer number one bids me 140 on farm weight, no shrink, and they're going to pick them up. So I, I'm doing this simply. I'm doing this simply to say I, I can ignore transportation cost here because I, I, I have no delivery cost to think about. So that's pretty straightforward. 750 pounds is what I think they weigh at a dollar 40. They're worth a little over a thousand bucks a piece. Okay, if that's a load of 65 head, that load's worth 68,250 bucks. That one's pretty straightforward. Let's say another buyer looks at those cattle and they bid me 142, but they want a 2% pencil shrink. So naturally this is a higher price and that can be attractive. How does this work in a practical setting? Well, you know that if, if they in fact did weigh 750 on the farm with the 2% pencil shrink, I'm gonna get paid on 735 pounds. Multiply that by the higher price. Those cattle are actually worth a little over $6 less a head and that group's actually worth about $400 less in total. So again, I've got a higher price but because of that pencil shrink, I'm getting paid on fewer pounds. I was actually better off in this case, take the lower price and, and not the shrink. And again, this, this math is pretty simple, right? If the price discount, if the price improvement, right, with the shrink exceeds the 2%, I'm better off to take it. In this case, the price improvement was less than 2%. So I was better off to actually sell them more pounds at the lower price. A little more complexity, but this is kind of things you, you might run into. So here's another buyer, bids me 146, a much better price, at least it sounds that way, but I've got to haul 100 miles to some way station near that buyer, for example. Um, and again, there's, you know, I, I don't know this to be a, you know, a set number, but, you know, 4% is probably not a bad guess on what those cattle might shrink, you know, low end shrink, even small hauls, 2%, it's very common, or even maybe 3%. So let's assume they, let's assume they shrink 4%. And then let's just kind of cheat and use, you know, you know, roughly trucking costs of like 450 per loader mile for a hundred mile haul. When I take that 4% pencil shrink, that actual pay weight is going to become 720 pounds. At the higher price, $1.46, I'm actually getting a little bit more for those cattle, all right, $1,051. But then I've got to knock off transportation cost here, okay? So when I net that out, although I've got, you know, actually a six cent higher price for buyer three than I did buyer one, by the time I account for the actual shrink that I might incur on those cattle, assuming my 4%, and I account for transportation costs, I could actually be worse off. So just understand that, you know, these can be fairly complex and understand how price and shrink kind of interact with each other in terms of what's the best way to actually move those cattle. The next thing I want to talk about is how we deal with weight uncertainties. 
And in a lot of cases, when cattle are sold, whether it be internet, whether it be internet with, de with uh, internet sale with delayed delivery, private treaty, or some type of forward contract, I don't know exactly what those cattle are going to weigh at sale time. In some cases, I may be pricing those cattle quite a bit further ahead from now, so it really is kind of a guess. And as Greg talked about, it, even I talked about some yesterday or uh, last night, you know, we certainly know that price per pound goes down as cattle get heavier, um, especially in a normal market with, with, uh, with normal feed prices. So we need some sort of process by which if we kind of agree on a base price, you know, what cattle we think cattle weigh, we need some way to adjust that price if those cattle come in different than that actual weight. And we'll walk through that now. So I'm gonna introduce a new, a new application of the term price slide to you. So thus far, we've talked about price slide in the sense, how does the market discount cattle as they get heavier? So if 750 pound steers you know, are selling for $1.46, you know, what's an 800 pounds, how much less per pound is 800 pound steer sell for? So that's kind of the concept in the actual market. We can also use a price slide as we sell cattle private treaty or through internet sales. The idea, okay, I don't know what they weigh for sure. Here's what I think they weigh. And then if they weigh differently, we'll adjust the price accordingly. And the way that price is adjusted is also called kind of a price slide, or I'm, I'm going to call it a, a pricing slide or an, or an artificial price slide. So for example, in that case, if I've got a base weight on some cattle, I'm planning to sell a 750, and we agree on a 146 per hundred weight sale price, we're going to use a price slide to discount the price of those cattle if they weigh different than 750. I'm going to walk you through just a couple quick uh, specifications here, and then we're going to do an illustration that I think will drive this home. So the way that price slides like this are usually expressed, it's an adjustment to the price per 100 pounds. So for example, you might see a price slide specified at what Greg has used before in the market around four bucks a hundred weight. And what that means is for every 100 pounds above the base weight, those cattle actually weigh, we're going to discount their price by four dollars a hundred weight or four cents a pound per pound they're over. Now, again, it, it doesn't have to be 100. So if they're 50 pounds over, I'm going to take half of that $4 discount of two bucks. 25 pounds over, I'm going to take 25% of that, which would be a dollar a hundred weight. So it, it, it works immediately after we get above the base, base weight. You'll oftentimes see this specification on slides. You'll see the slide written with up only. And what that means is the, the price gets adjusted downward if weight is above base. It does, what it really means is it doesn't work in the other direction. I mean, the price doesn't get bumped upward if weight comes down, if weight's less than expected. They don't have to be written that way, but more often than not, they are written that way so it protects the buyer from paying more for cattle that weigh more than they thought. The other thing you'll see on occasion is you'll see something like this where there's a price slide on the first 50 pounds of, in this case, four cents a pound, okay? And they might say something like it goes up to six cents as we get more than 50 pounds above. So what this really does is this really penalizes when I get further away from the base weight. So if I'm within 50 pounds of my base weight, the slide is four cents a pound. And when I get above that, it's six cents. And when you see the word retroactive in a sale catalog or in a, um, some sort of uh, some sort of offering. What that really means is that once we get to that 51st pound, okay, that price slide goes back to the very first pound. And that, that's the most common thing that you see is that retroactive specification. So here's here's an internet sale video description internet video internet sale description um, from has been several years ago now that I grabbed, but it kind of illustrates this concept pretty well. So simple example here. I've got 65 head of mixed heifers. You know, it, it's, it specifies kind of what they are. There's a base weight specified here. The seller is saying, I think they weigh about 780 pounds. They give you some sort of feel of the spread. And they've got that, there's that up only, slide up only, four cents a pound. So this is a four cent a pound or $4 per hundred weight price slide. There's more about the cattle here that I'm gonna kind of skip through. I'm gonna go here and mention this though, because we talked about this earlier. So. This specifies those weight conditions. So this says the cattle are gonna be gathered early. Okay, that means they're gonna be gathered up in the morning for loading, all right? And then morning cattle are less full than evening cattle. They're gonna be hauled 70 miles and weighed on the ground. So in that case, there's no need to shrink those cattle. They're gonna shrink a fair amount actually during that 70 mile haul. 
And when you see the word strength, that means there's no shrink. So what they weigh at that point is what the pay, what the pay weight's gonna be. And this is something else that's kind of interesting. They're gonna say after all cattle arrive. So, you know, I, I'm guessing I could haul all these cattle in one semi pretty easily. Perhaps this person used goosenecks, I don't know. What this really means is that they're not gonna weigh any cattle until they're all there from the farm. So in other words, if, if they were hauling, maybe I don't know, in three or four goosenecks, I'm, I'm making this up, I have no idea. What it really means is that those cattle that get there first are gonna stand there in the lot until all the others get there, then they're gonna be weighed. So it specifies more about shrink. So again, the important thing for the price slide discussion is I've got a base weight of 780 and I've got a price slide of four cents a pound or four bucks a hundred weight. So what if these cattle with that base weight 780 actually weigh 10? And this is, you know, very, you know, very reasonable, um, very reasonable change in price. So let's say that that went through internet sale like it did. They sold for 140, 100 weight, base weight 750. <coughs> had they weighed exactly 780, in other words, I had been spot on, would have been 780 pounds at $1.40 a pound or 140, 100 weight they sell for $1,092. In this case, they weighed 810. They were 30 pounds above that base weight. So that price gets adjusted downward because they weighed 30 pounds more than we thought they were. And the buyer, when he was bidding on these cattle, he or she was bidding on these cattle, they were bidding on them thinking they weighed 780. So we take that 30 pounds times that four cent price slide, that's $1.20 then I'm gonna subtract that $1.20 from the price that was agreed upon or actually that they sold for. So my $1.40, I subtract off $1.20, actual sale price becomes $138.80. I take the actual weight, the 810, times the new price, $138.80, and they sell for $11.24.28. So again, they still bring more per head. You know, this, the seller's not necessarily disappointed, right? but the buyer did get a little bit lower price per pound because the cattle weighed 30 pounds above what they thought they were gonna weigh. This comes up sometimes with folks that are new to selling cattle on price slides. And this question of, you know, do I wanna avoid a price slide discount? More often than not, the answer is no, but it does depend on how big that price slide is. So in truth, very seldom are price slides large enough to actually see per head values drop. So kind of in, in a very simple sense, oftentimes what it means is if the cattle come in above weight, they, may, they weighed more than the seller expected. And that's, that's oftentimes you know, a, a pleasant surprise. In reality, though, what really matters is how severe was that slide? In other words, in our previous example where I had those cattle advertised with a base weight of 780 and they weighed 10, the question also kind of becomes, would I have been better off to have sold them with a base weight of 810? or sell them at 780 and take that artificial price slide of four bucks a hundred weight. So this really comes down to how the, how the slides actually set up. But, but mo in most cases, the price slide is actually less severe than the market discount. I mean, the artificial price slide is actually a, a less severe penalty than had I sold those cattle in the market at, at their actual weight in the first place. Now, the fairest, and I hate to use the word fair, but I'm going to use it anyway, all right? But, you know, the, the fairest price slide is one that matches that market discount perfectly. So if Greg pulls up those market reports and he says, okay, 700 pound steers, you know, in, in, this, in this category sold for 142 and 750 sold for 139, all right? That implies that there's a $3 discount for that 50 pounds. That's a $6 100 weight market discount. So if I've got a price slide at exactly $6 a hundred weight, then in a lot of ways, the seller's kind of indifferent. It doesn't really matter if they weigh a little bit more than advertising the base weight because the price works out to be about the same. There's no incentive in that case to over or underestimate weight. So if that pricing slide that you use, that artificial slide, if it matches that market slide perfectly, then there's no incentive either way, okay? Especially if that works in both, both the, uh, the up and down, uh, direction. Now, if that pricing slide, that artificial slide is less than the market slide, then that's when I've got an incentive to actually underestimate weight. Literally what that means is, it means that the artificial slide is going to be a less severe penalty for weight than what the market would do. And there was some work back in 2001 um, using, um, oh gosh, superior livestock auction data, Wade Brorson, that found that very thing, that he found a tendency for folks to underestimate weight because the artificial price slides in most of the catalogs actually, you know, were, were a better deal than 
to inherit cattle first, then selling heavier cattle in the first place. You can also see the opposite sometimes. There's times when the artificial price slide, sorry. There's times when the artificial price slide is bigger than the market price slide. And if that's the case in a situation like that, then you've at least got incentive to match the base weight. Or if you've got a slide that works in both directions, there's actually some incentive there to actually overestimate the weight and then get better reward on the other end. So just important to understand, you know, how that artificial slide compares to what the market slide is. And again, the fairest way to have the best incentives is for that to work in both directions and for it to match the market discount almost perfectly. So a very simple illustration, and I'll leave this topic alone. But I've got cattle priced at $1.30, so, so 130 a hundred weight, all right? And let's say that's with a base weight of 800 pounds and a $4 price like, um, but then let's say the actual market discount is six bucks a hundred. So again, what that really means is, is that if I deliver these cattle at 900 pounds, they're actually gonna sell for 126. If instead I ran them through the ring at 900 pounds, they sell for 124, okay? So if the cattle arrive at 850, okay, then I'm gonna take half, I'm, so that, that's 50 pounds above. I'm gonna take half of that $4 discount, so 50 pounds at four cents a pound. So my pay, my price is now gonna be 128. They sell for 1,088 bucks. If instead I sold those same cattle on the market, that discount's steeper. The market discount is six bucks a hundred pounds on 50 pounds, that's $3. That actual sale price would have been 127. Those cattle bring about $8.50 less. Okay, so in this case, I was actually better off to take the artificial price slide, the actual artificial discount, as opposed to the market discount. And again, that can work in both directions. And in this case though, the seller did better with the slide. Um, you'll see this on occasion. Uh, Greg and I encountered this several years ago, but I just wanna kind of show you how something like this might work. Sometimes you'll see something written like this. You'll see a seller offering, and I'm using calves in this example, 550 pound steer calves at $1.35. And it'll say something like the 135 is firm, meaning that price didn't get adjusted, but they'll say pounds over 575, some number is free to the buyer. So what that really means is the price is set at 135, but the absolute maximum weight becomes 570. So it doesn't matter what the cattle weigh, all right? Once they get above 75, the actual price per head is $1.35 times 575 pounds. So if we look at this in practice, here's how this would work. So if the cattle weigh exactly 550 pounds, they sell for $1.35, they sell for $7.43 a piece. If the cattle weigh 575, they've got that same $1.35 price. They sell in this case for $776.25. If they weigh 600 pounds now, that price per head is fixed. They're still gonna bring, they're still gonna sell for the same, the $776.25, but on 600 pounds, you know, this, this works back to about $1.29 a pound. So bottom line is there's no real, I guess there's no real benefit to the buyer until those cattle get above 575. So from the seller's perspective, you know, what's the optimal weight for these cattle to come in at? Well, the answer is 575, right? Because I max out on both price and um, weight. So in this case, the seller has every incentive to make sure those cattle weigh as close as possible. That you know they don't want these cattle to weigh six plus. You know they want to be as close as possible to that 575. So just be aware of how something like this works. As a general rule, if you're selling cattle, um, you do want to have some sort of feel for the weight. So you know the question about on-farm scales was a good one. You know for for management purposes. Sure, you want to weigh cattle and get an idea. You know, there's there's a cost to doing that, I understand. And you, you, you've kind of got to weigh that. But, you know, if you're going to sell cattle off the farm, you, you want to have scales. You know, you want to know what those cattle weigh. Estimating weights visually is difficult. Um, it's, it's kind of a joke between Greg and I. I really stink at this, okay? I'm trying to get better, but I stink at it. But, you know, people who, people who look at cattle all the time and see cattle run through yards, you know, they're pretty good at this. And, you know, you know, others of us like myself are not. Um, and just understand that pay weight and base weight are two different things. So just, just a couple really quick illustrations of how not knowing weight can kind of bite you sometimes. So let's say I've got some cattle that I want to sell and I think they weigh around 775 pounds, okay? Someone comes out and looks at the cattle and they say, I think you're underestimating the weight. I think they weigh 825, okay? We look at the market, 825 pound steers, 
are selling for $1.35. We agree to that price, but we don't get any sort of specification for price slot, or we, we have a price slot that doesn't work in the other direction, so I don't get any price improvement if cattle come in less. And then let's say when the cattle are actually weighed at you know, some sort of waypoint, they weigh 750. Okay. Well, what's happening? You know, who, who's got the better deal here? Well, the answer is the buyer has, right? Because I kind of got focused on the 125 pound weight. In reality, that didn't matter too much once those cattle sold. In a sense, what they got is they got 750 pound steers for 825 pound price. So, you know, knowing weight matters, if you're going to sell cattle off the farm, I think you want to have scales on the farm you actually weigh those cattle on. Another kind of simple illustration that kind of makes the point too. And this one really, this one really comes back to, you know, negotiate steers and heifers differently. So let's say I'm a, as a seller, you know, I've, I've got some steer calves that weigh 550 pounds. We agree to a price of $1.50 and, and that's, you know, that's a good fair price, we'll say, okay. The same person looking at those cattle says, okay, you know, here's your, here's your heifers. What if I offer you, you know, 135 for them? And you look, and sure enough, you look at what you know, 550 pound steer sell for, and look at what 550 pound heifer are selling for, and you realize that that difference was about $15 a pound or 15 cents a hundredweight. So we agree. The question becomes, is this a good deal? Well, the truth is probably not, because those heifers on average, if they're in the same cohort, would have weighed less than those steers. So while that $15 a hundredweight discount made sense at 550, if those steers weighed 550, those heifers might have weighed, I don't know, 5, 5, 25, something, that, something less, okay? So there would have been some additional price advantage because they're lighter. So again, think separately on steers and heifers, and it would have certainly benefited the seller in this case to know what those cattle weighed. So my final thoughts, kind of walking through some of these nuts and bolts marketing concepts, we covered a lot of things fairly quickly, but number one, you want to use lot size to your advantage. Um, it can be your friend in terms of buying cattle, it can be your friend for selling cattle, and it can be your friend in terms of lowering what it costs uh, to, you know, to, to market cattle through commissions. You want to fully consider shrink, and I'll walk through some illustrations, but the most important thing is understand how shrink works, know it's a real cost, and also know that when you see something like a pencil shrink, how that actually works and how markets adjust. Understand price slides. And, you know, we talked about market price slides, meaning kind of the built-in market discount as cattle get heavier. And we talked about kind of those artificial price slides that are used for pricing that are oftentimes used. And you'll see those in private treaty negotiations. You'll see them in internet sales. So know how those work. And then, you know, the other thing, and, and this is true for everybody, regardless of how you sell cattle, but certainly at the more cattle you sell and the more different ways you sell them, the burden really is on you to understand the markets. You know, you, you've got to spend some time studying market reports, learning futures. You've got to learn, learn to know, you know, what your cattle are worth. Because if you're going to be pricing them in a way, especially other than the auction system, the burden's going to be on you to kind of be in charge of that price discovery. And that's a key responsibility that you need to kind of be aware of. Um, I'm going to end here with my contact info and I'll turn things back to Becky. And I will take any questions that you've got. And of course, feel free to, at, at this point, fire questions to me or Greg, either one. Thank you, Kenny. Um, just as a reminder, if you do have questions for Kenny or Greg, feel free to use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to put those in. Um, Kenny, we have one question and it's similar to another one we got last night, but um, it is, is the non-black hide discount seen in Kentucky also seen in the rest of the country? Good question. Um, the simple answer to the question is, is that the types of cattle that are preferred, meaning that are more valuable, do change different parts of the country, right? Depending on weather conditions, climate, that impacts the kind of cattle that are most desirable. Um, so that's kind of the simple answer. Um, specifically to the, the, um, the black hide question in Kentucky, about that sum. And I think in a lot of ways in Kentucky, it comes down to lot size. And the example that I use, I'm thinking back to some work that Greg and I did, uh, I guess it would have been that same study. We had, we had black cattle, we had, we had smoked cattle, we had different types of cattle. You know, uniform cattle, there wasn't a huge difference in price once we controlled for a lot size. I remember years ago looking at cattle out of the Paris stockyards and some of their CPA sales, and there were times when those smoke cattle, those, those black nose Charlays, would actually outsell the, the, uh, the uh, black and black baldy cattle. But in Kentucky, because we sell a lot of cattle in small groups, 
you know, you're going to have a lot of these, you know, singles, twos, three, small groups run through yards. And I think that's where the hide color comes into play sometimes. If I'm one of those buyers putting folks together and small groups of blacks come through, there's a lot better chance I can find more to go with those because we sell a whole lot more black cattle here. So I think it's kind of a function of that's what we have a lot of in the state and, and kind of lots of at the same time. Um, you also, in your last slide, made the comment to study the markets. And I know we talked about it a little bit last night, but can you just repeat again some good places for producers to go and study those markets and where to kind of keep up with? Sure. So, um, in fact, I'll drop those in the chat too, back here in just a second when we get a little break. But some of the sources I like. So we've talked about futures quite a bit. So, you know, you want to watch the futures market because that's essentially a price forecast for cattle prices in the center part of the U.S. And then kind of we've talked about adjusting that for Kentucky. So futures is number one. So cmegroup.com. Um, I would definitely get in the habit of looking at that Kentucky livestock grain market report, which has a lot of those, you know, it's has, it, it covers really all Kentucky, all cattle in Kentucky. Um, and I showed you a couple chart, or I showed you a couple pages from that. Um, the other thing that I showed was just the list from AMS that has almost all of Kentucky auction markets listed. So, you know, as soon as the sale is over, sometime before that night is over, um, you know, they'll, they'll post they'll post the report, and you can actually see what cattle brought forward there to the yards that day. So, you want to make you know you want to make a habit of studying those, and to the extent possible, you want to show up at the yard some and watch cattle sell because you know there's something that you don't get by seeing those reports that you do see by seeing cattle you know really move their yards there in the flesh. So remind me to drop those in the chat here too, Becky, while they're doing the evaluation. So um, the next question is, how do you adjust for heifers instead of steers? <sighs> So I assume that, is that more of a budgeting question for Greg or? Maybe both of you from, you know, your respective angles. There's not a, any more context than that. So maybe both of you kind of answer it from your different perspectives. You want to start, Greg, or do you want me to? I, I assume you're going to talk about maybe just the basis difference. And if, if you are, that you probably should go first because that will feed into the budgeting part. Sure. So when you think about, so the, the simple answer is if you were walking through kind of the budgeting stuff that Greg did, he talked about how to start with futures price, how to adjust for lot size and so forth. You're going to make another adjustment there for gender, right? So, okay, you know, what's the difference right now between, you know, steers in that weight category and heifers in that weight category? So let's just say that that's a $12 hunt weight difference. You're just going to simply adjust that price down by $12 for for heifers instead of steers. So just another step in that adjustment becomes I've got to adjust for the differential between steers and heifers the same way I would adjust for something like different weights. Yeah, and, th and that would feed into the budget the same form. In other words, you'd adjust your price and, and that would just kind of then automatically adjust. What can you, you're obviously not, so if we're using that to figure out what your sale price is on those heifers, that's going to feed in what can I bid to get say a $50 return or $75 return, whether you're backgrounding or, or stockering, and it's gonna lower your bit, you know, what you're able to bid to get that same 50 or $75 gross. Um, obviously when your sale price is, is 10 or $12 less per hundred weight. So the key step is what Kenny said, trying to figure out a realistic um, drop in basis for that heifer, that same size heifer versus steer. And then that feeds in the, in the budget side did pretty sim, you know, fairly easily. Let me add one more thing too I didn't think about. And this, you, know, you probably understand this already, but I'll say it to be clear. That differential, Greg mentioned weight, but that differential narrows as those weights go up, right? The, the reason why heifers sell for a lower price is because they tend to gain a bit less efficiently. So the more pounds that are on those heifers, right, the less of an issue that becomes. So just a you know, simple illustration, that might be a 15 or $20 differential, you know, when, when they're calves, it might be 10 when they're heavy feeders. When you get to fats, there's really difference at all. So, it, you know, don't, don't assume it's a constant number. It does vary based on the weight of those steers and heifers. Um, the next question asks, what types of considerations should be done if trying to allow several farmers to group their calves together in order to increase the lot size? 
So a good question. And, you know, I, I truly do believe that increasing lot size is one of the, the easiest ways we can add value to cattle here. And, you know, Greg and I mentioned that, you know, the data that I guess we showed there at one point was actually based on CPH sales. And, you know, we focus on CPH a lot of times for the health, for the health elements of it, right? But we also need to remember that something else that goes on is we, we do commingle those cattle and group them, right? So part of that premium comes from lot size as well. So in terms of considerations, you know, you've got to find folks you can work with easily, right? That's number one, you know, that have got similar types of cattle that will group together, folks that are flexible. And, you know, the other thing to think about is, um, and, and this is something that we don't think about a lot of times, let's just say that, you know, three of my buddies put together a group of cattle and we have a pretty good uniform truckload and we send them out west. And the average weight of those is 750, right? The three of us aren't all going to have our cattle average exactly 750, right? So we've got to have a formula by which we actually fairly allocate that price, right, based on the cattle that we got. So, for example, if those cattle weighed 750 on average, right, but the, the third of the load that I put together weighs 775, then I'm actually better off, right? Because I've got more pounds and I get that 750 price. So I need some way to kind of adjust that as a group. So just being communi open communication and talking through those things to me is key. So Kenny, what you're saying is you, you want a price slide that the three of you agree to for, so that the person that has less than average weight gets a higher price per pound than the ones that have heavier average, exactly. Mm -hmm. Here's the word fair again, which is probably not a good word to use, but that you've, that's probably, that's the fairest way to do it, right? Yeah. No, no, I agree. And I, I'll also say the same, that you need people that you trust and obviously to, to do that because other games you can play is someone can, if, if they're feeding the, cat, the cattle heavily, they're going to be a little fleshier and others. Exactly. And, and so for the same weight cattle, their, their cattle should sell a little bit less, but you're going to get the same price. So you need people that you, you trust and can work with. That's a great point. So the next question is, uh, when doing the stockyard pricing in your scenarios, do you ever take out commission, yardage, et cetera, in comparing pricing from off the farm? Or do you think it would make a big difference for producers' decisions on where to sell? You included commission and marketing cost in your budget, right, Greg? Yes, I think what they're asking is, are you better off selling the stockyard or should you consider selling the private tree? I, at least that's what I'm reading into it. Yeah, so again, that depends on price, right? But, you know, one of the things I think they wanted to kind of go through and why I wanted to walk through shrink and commission and things like this, because that's that's really how you evaluate those things, right? You know, you're, you're going to pay commission, you know, if you move cattle through an auction system, right? But let's also not forget that there's some advantages there too, right? Price discovery is easy. I'm not a negotiation process. Um, we mentioned this yesterday, but I've got very secure payment. There's a value in those things, right? And I, I don't want to gloss over that. So sure, I mean, there's there's lots of reasons to think about selling cattle private tree. You're using different methods, but just understand that, you know, you've got, you know, there's, there's a reason why we pay commission. It's because we're outsourcing some of those things. So you've got to, all of a sudden, you've got to kind of do those things yourself. And be up on the market enough to know that you can get the price those cattle would have brought had you sold them in a different way. Um, the next question is what source material is out there to get historical and current basis levels? I'm afraid the answer to this question is me. Um, <laughs> So, you know, you know, current basis levels are pretty straightforward, right? You know, you want to know what current futures prices are and compare that to what actual cattle sell for. Um, you know, the stuff that I showed you uh, yesterday or last night where we looked at different price charts, I've got that stuff historically and, and I'm happy to share it with you. I probably need to find a way to make that more readily available, Greg. Let's talk about that sometime, but, but I do try and track those. Somebody mentioned last night that I guess cattle facts track some of this too. And I think they maybe combined Kentucky and Tennessee. And I have to assume that they only have access to the same kind of market data I do. So, the, you know, there's stuff out there that I track and that's, that's available. And I mean, I'm, I'm a resource. I, I work for you all. I'm a resource for you. So reach out to me anytime. Um, that's all the questions that are in the Q&A box at the moment. Um, I do wanna call everybody's attention 
I know we had some technical difficulties getting uh, Greg and Kenny's slides shared in the chat box, but rest assured we will be emailing those out next week, along with a link to all of the recordings from all three sessions. Um, there was also some folks that were having um, difficulties using the link for the evaluation. So I will also share that in emails post conference as well, so that you have those um, to help us get feedback for future conferences and webinars. Um, Kenny, I think you have a code to share with the group, but if you all have any question, more questions, we can still take, we have time to take a couple more if you have those. Um, otherwise we'll start kind of wrapping up for the evening. All right, so I switched it up big time tonight. So the CAPE code is going to be back comp. So B A C K C O N F and then W E D for Wednesday. So it was number one last night. It's Wednesday tonight. So W E D. So if if you want CAPE certification, put this in. Put this in the line where it asks for speaker. I guess where the, where the speaker signature would be, and then give that to your county agent, and then we can verify attendance if necessary via the via the webinar logs. And Becky, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually drop a couple of things in the chat, the reports okay. that I talked about while they're looking at the evaluation, if if that works. And I apologize. Yep. So if if you want those links stick on, I need just maybe two or three minutes here. And I'll have them in there. That's fine. And we will also share those links as part of the wrap up uh, from the conference too. So there'll be a a long email that has all of the resources that we've referenced over the last two nights and anything new that comes out of tomorrow as well. Um, so just as kind of wrapping us up, I thank all of you for joining us this evening. Uh, we do appreciate the support of the Kentucky Agriculture Development Fund for their support of these webinars and any future webinars that we do. Um, just as a reminder, we did record tonight's presentations and we will be sharing the links to those videos as well as all of the PowerPoint slides in email correspondence next week. Uh, we will be back here again tomorrow evening for session three, managing and protecting your profits. Um, if you haven't had a chance to register for this session, you can do so by visiting K KY Beef Network dot com backslash webinars um, and you can register there it is the same webinar link that you've used the last two nights so uh, you can do that to join as well and we do appreciate all of your time and your great questions the last two nights and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow evening uh, thank you all and have a good night